Awesome. Well, good morning, everybody, or afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are uh, in our global Drupal audience. Uh, but this is Holly Ross. I'm the executive director at the Drupal Association. And I am really excited to bring you today's webinar, Drupal Eat in Practice. Now that we have our first release candidate out, I know everyone's eager to start building with Drupal 8, but these brave souls did it first, <laughs> or close to first. <laughs> um, and so they want to share some of the lessons that they learned along the way as you begin your Drupal 8 journeys. Uh, so we're excited to have them. Before we get started and talk about our presentation, though, just want to share a couple of housekeeping announcements with you. So the first is that we are recording today's session. So uh, you will be able to reference this again and share it with your colleagues. We'll get that out to you uh, a little later this afternoon. Um, and then the next thing that you need to know is that um, we do have everyone muted today just to keep the background noise to a minimum, but that does not mean that we don't want to hear from you. So feel free to share your questions throughout the session today. And you should have on your GoToMeeting control panel there a question section where you can throw your ideas and questions into, and I will help moderate those today. Um, we'll try to take some along the way, but we'll just we'll see how things go. Uh, but feel free to use that. Um, and I think those would be important notes from today. Let's see. We have a hi from Serbia. So we do have a very international audience today. And it is evening somewhere. Oh, good <laughs> <to know. laughs> Hello, Serbia. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, so with that, uh, let me turn things over to um, to our content today. It's the reason you're all here. Um, today's presentation is brought to you uh, by Phase Two and Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, our oh, thank you very much, Frank. Our speakers today uh, we've got Frank Fabrar, who's the CTO at Phase Two, and Jonathan Hedstrom, who's their software architect, and they worked with uh, Jake Rockwitz and Evan Liebman at MSK on the site. So I'll let you guys do the real introductions and take away the content. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Um, my name is Evan Liebman. I'm the Director of Digital Communications at MSK, and I oversee um, our development group, our technical group, and also um, the user experience strategy for um, MSKCC.org and SloanKettering.edu. Jake. Hi, uh, my name is Jake Rockwood. Um, I've worked with Sloan Kettering as a consultant for the past almost 15 years, helping them navigate through a custom-built CMS to Drupal 6 and to Drupal 8, finally. Frank? Hey there, I'm Frank Fabrero. I'm the CTO at Phase 2. Uh, I worked with the, the MSK team kind of from the beginning, from, uh, uh, from, from you know, the, the decision to move forward all the way through to, uh, to the end. I, was, I served as a technical advisor for the team. I'm Jonathan Hestrom. I've been working with Drupal for nearly 10 years, and I worked throughout the MSK project, helping them um, address uh, issues that they were encountering in both core and Kintrip. Fantastic. Evan? Sorry, I was on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, researchers at MSK regularly push boundaries to innovate, and um, we're inspired by their relentless efforts and are driven to do the same in our space. So, um, you know, what, Frank, if you can just go ahead to the next slide, I want to share with you, um, you know, some of the reasons why we chose Drupal 8. And so, um, first, I just want to take a step back um, to April 2013, where Jake um, came into our office and um, made a presentation to our group to talk about Drupal 8. And at this time, we would, we had just launched a Drupal 6 site in November of 2011. Uh, we really weren't starting to yet think about moving to a new version of Drupal, let alone Drupal 8. And so um, it was really, you know, Jake had this mantra of um, D8, don't be late. And you know, it was there's there's a lot of things that shape up to why MSK chose Drupal 8. Uh, but it was really um, initially it was it was Jake driving us there, and um, Jake, um, as he said, he's been with us for about 15 years. Um, he is a developer extraordinaire and very uh, brilliant in many areas, and he helped us uh, get onto that path. Um, so at MSK, we are Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, we are a hospital, also a research um, and training facility. Um, and so, um, you know, what we believe here at MSK is strongly in a, co in, in a culture of innovation. 
Um, and it's, you know, we believe that it's the relentless pursuit of unmatched expertise uh, that results in breakthrough advances. And so we have researchers and, and clinicians who regularly push the boundaries to innovate and generate new knowledge um, and to continually develop new methods for treatment. And we're inspired by their relentless efforts and are driven to do the same in our space. And so when, you know, when this idea came forward from Jake and we started to think, well, you know, how does this, how does this circle up to our strategic pillars and the things that we like to think about here at MSK? Um, the innovation factor played a major role in pushing this forward because, um, you know, if we think about, you know, what's being done here and we, you know, we want to strive to push um, the boundaries in our space. And so um, that, that was really important to us. Um, another piece was, um, well, it says sustainability here, but really what is financial sustainability? Um, you know, every, um, every update that we've done, um, you're going from that proprietary system that Jake had built for us years ago to Drupal 6 and into Drupal 8, it's always been tied to a redesign. And so uh, when we finished uh, the D6 site in 2011, um, we had just missed the boat on D7. And uh, we didn't want to go into D7 with a new redesign and then start thinking about moving to D8 and a new redesign right now. And so we, we sort of had this this goal to push forward um, a, a redesigned site to, um, you know, match up with our competitive advertising campaign. And so had we, you know, and we wanted to do that in May of, you know, April, May 2015. And so uh, we didn't feel it was sustainable to launch something in, launch a D7 site, a D7 site in, in, at that time and then start thinking about D8. So we, you know, we kind of knew right away that the financial piece to this wasn't really shaking up to a D7 site and it helped, you know, propel us towards D8. Um, and another piece here was talent recruitment. Um, you know, I think everyone will, will sort of nod their head in agreement that talent talent is really hard to find, right, right, Frank? That, that's probably a challenge there um, everywhere at every every organization. And so, um, you know, we you know we one thing that I looked at, which I don't really know will come to fruition, but you know, I thought about symphony and object oriented programming and thought, well. There's people out there that are doing that now that may not even be thinking about Drupal and working in Drupal. And to me, that, that sort of brought in the talent pool. And, you know, I, we've done a pretty decent job here in, um, in recruiting over the past couple of months to build our team here internally. And, um, you know, it is very challenging to recruit. Um, although, you know, I think also the push to D8 helped us do that as well. So being an early adopter um, and, you know, people being really interested, like, oh, you're in D8, that's, that's pretty cool. That's maybe something I want to do. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that's, that's the, the idea of Symphony object-oriented programming, broadening a talent pool, and being the first in Drupal 8 was really, um, really helped push us towards, um, towards Drupal 8. And then, and then finally, um, the community piece, and this is, you know, this is um, really important work to us that, that Jonathan really helped push, and and you know there's there's thousands of contributors to Drupal 8, and um, you know we felt it was really important because we've always taken a little bit from Drupal, and uh, we felt that it was really important as an organization to give back, even if in a you know a small scale or whatever whatever we felt you know whatever we you're able to do, um, you know we just felt that we're all trying to solve you know similar problems, and we can leverage people's work, and people can leverage our work. Um, and, and bigger problems could be solved. So um, being able to contribute to the community was um, very a very big deal for us. Right, and so if we want to talk a little bit more about the, the CMS landscape in general, I mean, uh, MSK had some had some pretty big uh, had some pretty big goals there. And you know, when we when we talk about the, the CMS landscape in general, we're seeing a lot of shifts in consumption. So the world of content and content management is kind of changing more rapidly than than ever before. Um, and at the same time consumption is is both being fragmented and consolidated. It's kind of weird but I'll get into that for a sec. Um, like it all started with mobile obviously and you know mobile accounts for over 60 percent of of um, content consumption on the web right now which is amazing. Um, and it went from mobile, but now it goes into all sorts of other things like Internet of Things devices, over-the-top things like Roku apps and Xbox and, and things like wearables. And, you know, at the same exact time that there's more and more places that, that content can get consumed, um, more, you know, fewer and fewer apps are in some ways actually tr controlling the, the consumer experience. And it started with things like Flipboard and it's progressing now into places like Facebook and Apple News where, where there's fewer and fewer sometimes places that people actually go to get their content. 
um, and you know having a platform that can support all both this fragmentation and consolidation is is a important aspect when we get into modern architecture so while the content ecosystem has been morphing over time the way that we build those systems also has been so in response to both the way content is consumed and, and how these systems need to morph and scale quicker, um, the decoupled architecture of, of Drupal 8 is kind of in direct response to the need for things like rapid deployment and, and the evolution and, and responding to your, to your audience's needs. Um, and then, you know, things like not, not always wanting to have to bundle an entire release of everything in order to ship something, like to be more nimble, to be able to ship front ends faster um, without having to bundle that with a back end deployment. Like those things have changed the way we build systems as well. Um, and when we speak about the front end, kind of, I would say that long gone are the days where um, the primary driver of how you engage with your audience is, is like limited by what your CMS can deliver. Um, you know, the CMS can't really be something that gets in your way anymore. It has to be more of an enabler for the things that you want to do. And, you know, where in a world where context and reaching your audience is kind of more important than ever, um, you kind of can't just rely on your CMS anymore. I mean, there's all sorts of things, Facebook and Instagram and Tumblr and all these other places where you actually engage with your audience. Um, and we need to be able to kind of support that. And the integration capabilities of your CMS kind of has to play more of a unifying role to bring to bring all that together, and that's kind of more important than ever before. Um, and I guess to quote myself, here's a, here's a, you know something that I've said: your CMS no longer needs to do everything, but it's increasingly becoming uh, the place where everything comes together in your content ecosystem. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the features of MSKCC.org. Yeah. So. Um, no, sorry. Okay, um, thanks, Jake. So, um, yeah, just to give you a sense of, of the scale of the, of the site, um, you know, um, this is a pretty major, a pretty big um, site we've got here. And um, you can see here what we put in front of you, 32 content types, 30,000 plus nodes, and, and so forth. I mean, I, I think the point here is that this is not, um, this is not a brochure site. This was a major, um, move towards um, this was a move towards a major um, upgrade in Drupal 8 with, with a very large website that that serves seven personas um, that has related content faceted search web forms online payment uh, prediction tools uh, LDAP authentication and um, you know just to speak to the analytics piece we get about 5.5 uh, to 6 million unique visitors per year um, so being able you know you know Drupal 8 you, I, you know I know there's some thoughts about D8, you know, might work well for your blog or might work well for your organization website or your brochure site. Um, but you can you can go ahead and even at this time in release candidate put a major site into into Drupal 8. Jake. All right, Jake, you want to talk a little bit about some of the features? Yes. Um, this is the screencast. It's going to start in a second. It's, I'm just walking through a couple of quick features on the site. I'm actually starting with search because it's a really simple feature, but it brings up a really interesting point about Drupal 8. Is it's just using Google Site Search. And this was actually pretty easy to, to implement because Google Site Search is a well-documented API, and Drupal 8 is very good at consuming APIs. And it's also just showing all the teasers on the site, which I'm going to get to more with the front end. And I'm walking through the different paths of the site. So we're looking at clinical trials. And finally, locations. And I'm going to click through a location detail in a second. And the next feature I just want to show is kind of layout, that we have custom layouts on the site. Um, this is done with some custom code. Um, it allows a flexible layout with dynamic content. Um, this is an example of a location page. And a, a better example would be there's a campaign called More Science, Less Fear. And this is a very rich page with a lot of interactive features. Um, I'm going to show a video. And even the video playing is just another example. It's really not hard to implement a YouTube video on your site. Um, we also do bright code, and the dialogue is just core. Um, and another common thing besides layout that we're going to move on to, two seconds, is making an appointment. And this is a very simple, another text-driven layout. Um, but the, the appointment form is one of the most important forms on the site. We were able to implement you know, a custom form module that allowed um, to leverage all of Drupal Core's form API 
um, with a little bit of YAML to help support it and store some data. Now, the next part of this is I want to show the prototype because Frank had brought up the separation of front end to back end. So this is a front end static HTML prototype. And what I'm going to start walking through is all the static comps that you just saw. And they were all built completely outside of Drupal. The, the front end people had no knowledge of how Drupal worked. They did all the code outside of Drupal. And then we brought this in using the Twig and, Twig and the other improvements in core and all the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript was just brought into Drupal. Um, this is now showing just the forms, all done outside of Drupal. Um, and then the final piece is also the teasers. Every single teaser widget on the site, call out to a node, is done in this front end. Um, it just Definitely, like our approach, we didn't do 100% headless Drupal, but we definitely developed the front end of the site outside of Drupal and then brought it in. And I think the key thing there it goes back to is you can definitely separate your front end and back end, your resources, your concerns. Um, it makes it possible to change the front end at a different point. Um, that's it for me. Hey, Frank, um, this is Holly. I just yeah. want to interject. We, we had one question, which was, um, is you, did, are you linking your site to a CRM, and, and what is that if you are? So um, this is Evan. We're we're not linking to to a CRM. Um, there is a um, um, a goal for for 2016 to bring a CRM on board, um, but at this time there's there's no link of a, to a CRM. Uh, what about uh, profiles? You link to a profile system, don't you? Um, to address that, the site right now is all anonymous traffic from a front end perspective. We use Drupal's on user profiles for just internal users editing content. We do have about 300 people editing content on the site. All right, jumping ahead. So these are some of the things that um, that Jake just talked about. You know, there was search and layout um, forms and, and the prototype library. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the some of the building blocks that the site's built on. Yeah, so uh, this is Jonathan. Uh, one of the really interesting statistics of this project was that the Drupal 6 site had um, 114 contrib modules, and this list right here is the sum total of all contrib modules used in Drupal 8. And that wasn't replaced by custom code either. Um, I think there was one more custom module in Drupal 8 than in Drupal 6. Um, so, you know, that really speaks to, A, how much more functionality has gone into core uh, for Drupal 8, and B, how much easier it is to do complex things with less code. Um, one of my favorite examples of the upgrade that we worked on, we helped in one way or another upgrade all of these modules to 8, um, but the redirect module in Drupal 6 has a lot of different hooks it has to implement, a lot of boilerplate. In 8, aside from the configuration form, it really boils down to a single event listener class that just intercepts incoming requests. And if it finds a redirect, it acts on that. And along the way, the global redirect module was also integrated into the redirect module in a matter of days. Um, it, you know, it's just the, the cleanness of the code makes these upgrades a joy rather than I remember upgrading modules from Drupal 6 to 7 and at the time it seemed okay but you were in retrospect really just renaming some hooks and um, in contrast the 8 upgrade allows you to just cut out so much cruft and boilerplate. Uh, if you can go to the next slide Frank. Yep. Um, along the way um, I think as Evan mentioned they started at least Jake started with uh, some semblance of a prototype in Drupal 8 way back in 2013. Um, I came onto this project at the um, almost just over a year ago, I think. And um, as they were building back then, that would have been beta one or beta two. Um, a lot of core issues were encountered, uh, and so my job, for the most part, was to take the bugs and lack of features Jake was finding and go um, try and address those in the issue queue. Uh, one of my favorite and also hardest patches to get in was uh, views integration for the date module, which prior to that patch, the only views integration for the date module was it treated date fields as a string, so you couldn't do any sort of relative date handling. Um, that patch got committed three times and reverted twice. It was quite the battle. 
Um, another really, really powerful thing that's in Drupal 8 but has no UI is uh, the concept of uh, moderation, um, meaning that built into core is, is the idea of forward revisioning, meaning all of the complexities of having different revisions, you know, like a draft state is in core, there's just no UI for it. So there was a relatively straightforward patch that we worked on for MSK that allowed um, node moderation, uh, meaning they can they can edit things in draft and people with permissions can look at those drafts while the live version continues to be um, you know unchanged. Uh, there were numerous numerous bugs of all different severities that were encountered. Um, both um, in APIs, just missing fundamental functionality or, you know, fatal errors that you could encounter through the UI. Um, and then once they went live in May on beta 7, um, there were there was the occasional security uh, patch that would get committed and those we needed to backport immediately to the site. Um, yeah, could you go to the next slide, Frank? After they launched in May, they were on beta 7, and the core, the official beta to beta upgrade path didn't become a thing until beta 12. So in those months, uh, my job at that point became pretty much solely focused on the core upgrade path. Um, that meant working on core issues that were blocking that upgrade path, and also starting to work on the actual upgrade path that would be unsupported from beta 7 to beta 12, and that work took place in the contrib head-to-head -head module. Um, along the way of working on that unofficial upgrade path, I think we found at least half a dozen core critical issues that were related to all upgrade paths. So that work, in addition to pushing the core upgrade path forward so that, you know, eventually RC1 could come out last week, uh, it also found many bugs that might not have been found uh, had people not been working on that unofficial upgrade path. Great, thanks, Jonathan. So, you know, the question that you know we always hear and, and get gets asked is, should you consider Drupal 8 for for your next site? Um, and some of the questions that you know we like to ask um, about whether your current CMS, whether you know. Usually, if it's not Drupal, but it, you know, sometimes even if it is, you know, are you able to present content and media through a variety of channels? Um, is it responsive? Does it support engaging experiences? Um, is it supported by your vendor or a community? Will it continue to be? You know, this might be a question for for much older versions of Drupal um, as well as as other CMS that are out there. Um, and can it easily integrate into your existing enterprise architecture? You know, the multitude of systems is growing, um, and no longer can you have these stovepiped applications in your, you know, inside your walls. So, you know, your CMS is one of those. Um, so when we think about what makes uh, Drupal 8 really good for the enterprise, you know, these are some of the things that we think about. You know, we think about omni-channel capabilities, which is basically allowing for the continuity of, of experience that your brand needs today across all the channels that you're interacting with. Um, you know, responsive design. Uh, it's built responsively from the ground up, you know, to include the administrative experience. This is a big deal for organizations that need access, you know, wherever they might be. Uh, we talked about the decoupled framework, um, you know, which is, you know, it allows systems to be built uh, in a more future-proof way. Um, developing systems kind of in more of like a microservices fashion it allows less coupling of systems and more uh, flexible both development, integration, deployment. Uh, improved developer experience, this is something that Jonathan just talked about before when upgrading modules. Um, you know, using modern PHP features um, and, you know, and the frameworks that we've brought in from outside the Drupal community have been really great. It allows, it allows everybody to do a whole lot more with a whole lot less. Um, the result is kind of more productive and, and happier uh, team members. Um, and, you know, that comes from knowing that you have, like, this truly powerful tool in your hands, and it's, like, a really good feeling. It's, it's empowering for folks working on these things. Uh, as Jake showed with that prototype library, you know, the front end requires less Drupal-specific expertise, um, and that allows you to pull from a much broader pool of, uh, of design and experience folks to really help, help you connect with your, with your audience. And um, multilingual support, I mean, you know, these days, obviously, with online borders are less and less relevant. Um, you know, 
being able to connect to your audience both where they are and in the language they speak is really key. And this is really the first version of Drupal that, you know, top to bottom has this wonderful multilingual experience. You know, even in Drupal 7, you know, to get to get the right thing to happen in a lot of cases required, you know, almost sometimes up to 20-ish contrib modules. Um, and now I think there's it's down to about four or so, and they're all in core. Uh, it's all there, and it's really great. Um, so, you know, the question, like we said, uh, is Drupal 8 right for you? You know, if you've been waiting, don't. Um, now that there's RC1 out, we think it's uh, even more of a reason to jumpstart, you know, DA development. Um, even if you don't have something that's going to be built right away, I think it's a, a really great time to start to understand the platform and play with it and bring your teams up to speed. Um, you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering is, is proof that that major Drupal 8 builds can be done. And think about how far how far in the past they started. I mean, th this journey for them started, you know, 18 months or more ago. And uh, Drupal 8 was much less mature, but you know, we were still able to work together and and get a and get a great deployment happening. Um, so here are some of the things that you know we like to do. So Drupal 8 obviously still RC. Uh, Contrib isn't isn't fully up to uh, fully up updated yet. So um, you know, one of the things that we say is like plan for the D8 learning curve. Um, you know, your team's going to start a little slower than they currently are if you're if you're working in earlier versions of Drupal. Um, you know, things are just different. There's new paradigms that need to be discovered and kind of ingrained into the team's collective knowledge. Um, but you know, we found that after just a couple of weeks, once everybody is up to speed. Um, there's really just this increasing pace, which is which is really great to see. Um, once the once the platform's understood, like I said, doing more with less um, is really great. And um, you know, with if you have the right team, you should you should totally see that. Um, you know, with respect to the contrib space, you know, the, there's the question. You know, do you wait for contrib to catch up? You know, do you do you wait for the things that you need to be out there before you start building? Um, and you know, the good news is that since this is an entirely different system. Uh, sometimes the things that are in contrib that you used previously you don't need anymore. Uh, there's there's other or better ways to do it, or it's built into core. You know things like views being in core. It's a it's a wonderful thing. It's a great it's a great way to be able to rely more fully on core to do the things that you need than contrib. Um, but you also have a really good opportunity to push the contrib space forward too, and and you know to take on like a key module for you and to to help the community upgrade it. Um, you know, it's really great to give back and, and to and to get those advanced use cases into the contrib space for other folks. Um, and then with environmental consistency, this is really a, a really key factor in mitigating risk. And and especially in Drupal 8, it, it's really new, so there hasn't been deployment across a wide variety of platforms. Um, you know, with Drupal 7, it's basically been installed and run everywhere. So a lot of the gotchas have kind of been figured out. With Drupal 8, it's still a little bit more narrow in the places it's been deployed. So um, getting something uh, strong and stable from the beginning, from dev through to production, getting your environment set, um, you know, using dependency management and things like that so that you can ensure that you have the right versions of, of both software and operating system and the right versions of, of core and contrib, um, you know, things like make files and composer files and stuff like that are all, are all really great there. Um, and you know, uh, these days there's also you know the hosting providers like Acquia, Pantheon, and Platform SH are all D8 ready these days. So that's another option uh, with respect to um, having good environmental consistency uh, and mitigating risk via, via prototyping. Obviously, exploratory development early on to see how core and contrib will help meet your needs. Um, that's a really key aspect of any like early release cycle development. And the quicker you know which problems are going to be challenging to you, the better you can plan for your contingencies. Um, you know, sometimes you have to have a plan B and sometimes C, and and knowing where that is early will allow you to address your risks early um, and get them out of your way. Okay, so uh, so what's next for MSK? Um, a lot actually. Um, so um, one thing that is um, on our radar right now is um, integration into our patient portal, MyMSK, using the REST API. Um, and so Jake's um, doing a lot of work there um, to get over to this um, MyMSK patient portal um, 
on a uh, .NET platform. Um, lots of content that we have in our for for our physicians, for our disease guides, um, so that uh, patients are able to see that information in that experience under my MSK. Um, and also starting to think about the CRM piece as well, and and how that relates to the REST API. Uh, but that's probably something for. Um, for 2016. Uh, refactoring templates, um, moving to Pattern Lab is something that's on our radar um, that we're starting to set up for right now. Um, some API cleanup, uh, better test coverage, performance optimization, starting to pull in contrib modules for new functionality. Um, and um, one thing that we're grappling with right now is um, the upgrade to, uh, I think we're on beta 15 now, and um, we are grappling with a move to 16 or a move to RC1. Um, just you know, it, you know, some of these concerns are related to resources, but um, just trying to figure out what is what is the best move for us as we have sort of a lot of a lot on our plate right now. Um, and then lastly, um, thinking about um, building a platform um, in D8 in 2016 for um, other MSK departments um, who want to have external content, um, but their uh, material, their content doesn't really belong on our site, so um, or doesn't fit well there, I should say. Um, so thinking about, about doing that platform in 2016 as well. And that's it. Great. So, um, yeah, you know, if you if you're, you know, if you think you're ready to take the next leap to Drupal 8, um, you know, let's let's get some questions answered. Uh, we have we have some time here to to answer some questions, and you know, phase, phase two is available to help. Awesome. Thanks, Frank, and and everyone for for that. That was really interesting, and we're gonna uh, let some folks uh, filter in with the questions. But I was. Um, Actually, uh, just really curious. So Jonathan was saying that um, you know they they found that porting some of the modules over to Drupal 8 was was much easier this time. And I don't know if you wanted to share a few more details about um, you know why that was so. Um, I know we have lots of contrib maintainers out there who are going to start down that path shortly, and uh, it'd be it'd be great to hear any lessons learned about that. Sure. Um, like I mentioned with redirect, there's just 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 to get access to the really low level functionality in eight where you need to interact. There's it, you can do that with just so much less boilerplate. So rather than having to implement you know ten different hooks just to get your one key function called, you can for the most part just get that function in a class and hook it in in the right place and then it'll work. Um, and then another big piece is so much went into core, um, including things like entity reference at a very low level. So even things like organic groups, which were these behemoths in, in Drupal 7 because they were doing so much outside of core. I'm not going to say organic groups is going to be easy, but it will just be leveraging concepts that are now native to core uh, rather than inventing a whole system like entity reference outside of core and then adding all the access control on top of that. Um, yeah, and for modules, other, no. for modules that we're upgrading, like features, um, you know, in, in Drupal 7, features was doing both import and export of configuration as well as the bundling of configuration into um, kind of more uh, use case friendly modules. And, you know, for us with CMI getting into core, it, all of the work that had to do with um, with import and export got to go away. We didn't even have to do that. CMI, uh, CMI handled that for us, which was fantastic. And then the places where we did have to do overrides, instead of building entire different subsystems to handle the override, we were able to just extend a couple of services and override a method, and that was it. It was uh, it was pretty amazing. Awesome. Um, uh, let's see, I think you guys also mentioned you have about 35 content types. Can you talk a little bit more about those and the process that you went through to understand what content types you needed? Um, I, I can address that. I mean, one really important thing to state about the hospital's website is it really is two and possibly three websites because it's addressing patients and Sloan Kettering is a research institute, so it's like the clinic, clinicians, patients, and doctors, and then you have researchers, which are people working in labs, and then they have their lab members, their staff members, their students. Um, and, and then there's another side with doctors is referring physicians, kind of a slightly different take on the doctor. And what kind of happens is 
each one of those requirements just broke down the content types in different sections. So for example, we don't have a generic bio content type. We have a doctor content type and we have a researcher content type. We have a clinical staff member, which is can be someone like a nurse or uh, yeah, basically it's for nurses or executives or you know people working on that side of the hospital. And then we have a research um, staff member. And that specificity on site kind of required the, the 32 content types. Um, I could get into listing most of them, but I feel like that's a little crazy. Um, and then we have the standard ones, which I think are just important to emphasize. It's like we have events, locations, blogs, forums. Um, we do teaser content types to do the little call-outs on the site. So we just need a, a title and an image. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, I think that hopefully addresses the question. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit more about the content process in general? I mean, so 30,000 notes of content. <laughs> Um, so when did the work on the, the UX and the information architecture and the content strategy in general, when did that begin? Did that start before the 18, you know, the 18 month timeline you mentioned um, or did it start earlier than that? Yeah, I mean even from the migration from a custom CMS to Drupal 6, like we took what we had and used that as a starting point. So I was just migrate, we migrated the content types as is and then when the discovery was done on the Drupal 8 site. We manipulated some content types. We removed some content types. We merged a few. Um, and so it's kind of been an evolving process. I, I'll admit we don't start a new site and say we're going to start from scratch on every content type. It's kind of, that becomes overwhelming. And there's been a lot of previous work done in discovery on that we really did need to keep doctors and researchers separate. It did come up to merge them. And the conclusion was it's easier. And one of the key points there is researchers actually maintain their own pages and doctors do not. Doctors have a single node. They go, um, they send their resume or whatever information they want to someone and they fill it out. But researchers have going constantly updating their staff members and projects. Um, yeah, that's, so it's, the content types have been an evolving process over, over 10, 15 years. And to answer um, a piece of your question, um, so the, the strategy UX engagement actually began in April 2014, um, and that's something um, MSK worked with um, Digitas LBI on. And so we, you know, we worked with two agencies in this process, um, and um, a lot of the so I mean much of the content carried over from the D6 site. Um, there was some new content um, that was created, but we also cut a lot of content. Um, and to the point of contributors, um, I guess there's there's probably four large groups of contributors. There's the researchers that Jake described who um, go into their their lab pages, or a lab member goes in and edits that content. Um, we have a, a pretty large about herb section um, under integrated medicine. Um, they've got a few writers, editors there, and producers that are um, creating content. Um, and patient and caregiver education materials is also a major chunk of that 30,000 uh, set of pages that has their own group of writer editors that, that contribute. And then um, within communications, which is um, the group I'm in here, um, we have a large group of writer editors as well that really focus on um, patient content and healthcare professional content. And Holly, I'll add one little administrative thing is, so we have 32 content types. There are actually 32 admin views for each one of those content types. So the person responsible, the team that's responsible for herbs gets their own admin table that exposes certain hidden fields that they might need to monitor, like they like to track their images. And PatientNet has a lot of, they have translations, so their admin UI has support for sorting by translation. And that pattern has helped significantly with Drupal 8. So every single content type has an admin. It's, it's a table. It's basically a table with a lot of exposed um, form fields. Gotcha. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's interesting to me because I, I was just at a, a net camp over the weekend just listening to other people, how they handle content. Um, so it, it's been, uh, there's lots of different ways to do it for sure. Um, let's see. One more what, uh, so one more question here uh, uh, about uh, this one's about search. So um, you you mentioned that um, search in D8 was a little more out of the box, but that definitely looks like a different impl implementation of search than we've seen uh, for most sites. So can you talk about how you implemented it and did okay. you use fat bits or? Okay. Well, well, we had two search options. It was like Google Site Search 
mm-hmm. and um, Apache Solar. And Apache Solar did not was not had not been ported to Drupal 8 yet. And personally, I was a fan of Google Site Search because I felt the results weighted a little better. And we did discover, we did test and confirm that for MSK, Google Site Search um, returned better results generally. And all that stuff is done in the Google Site Search API. Like it's all done in Google's service. Um, the facets are just basically tagging URLs based on patterns. So the URL pattern in MSK is like mskcc.org/doctors. And so in the Google Site Search, you're able to just set up those facets. And then from a code perspective, all we had to do was call Google's API and present the results. And it's the front end of that site search was done outside of Drupal. So then I just kind of set those facets in the tabs. Um, and we are using core search. I just want to add that if you go to like the blog and you do a search, core search allows you to do uh, integrated searches with views, so you can have a keyword search and a filter by tag working together. And so we are leveraging core search for some of our smaller searches on the site. And it's fine because those searches only search somewhere between 500 to 1,000 records usually. Gotcha. Okay. And do you have any commerce functionality on the site? Yeah. Yes, and we're, we have a very simple requirement. I think this brings up when you might want to approach custom code is we just need people to make payments when they're registering for events. We're not having a login. The site's totally anonymous. And just as they fill out the form at the bottom, they need to pay with a credit card. So we just wrote a custom module to collect that payment. We're also using a custom web service backend to, to, to deal with that transaction. Okay. So that was our approach. If you needed a full e-commerce site, I'd strongly recommend it to wait for Contrib to catch up. Great. OK. So, um, you know, one of the things we hear frequently is that the learning curve from C7 to D8 is going to be a little bit tough. Um, and so one of the questions we have is, you know, are there any references or, or um, you know, materials that you found really useful in helping to make this, make this project happen? Jonathan, do you want to take that for your initial, from your core perspective on how you got up to speed on D8? From my, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, one one of the earliest ways I got into D8 was writing tests um, back, you know, almost five years ago, um, and that helped a lot. But I, that's certainly not for everybody. Um, there, there's a variety of approaches. One thing I recommend heavily is if you know a, a core module in Drupal 6 really well, you know how it works from from an inside-out perspective, just go take a look at, at how that has changed in 8 as an exercise. Um, the, the list of changes, there are thousands of them, but if you encounter you know a function or a hook that you were relying on in 7, if you search for that by name, in the you know in the change logs, you will find um, hopefully only one record of how it's changed. Um, so that you know that's a really good low-level developer asset um, for site builders. Not a whole lot of the concepts have changed. You know, if you're going through the UI, it's better, much better. Um, but the concept of adding fields to things is the same as it was in seven. There's just more types, you know, views is there out of the box. The views UI hasn't changed at all that I know of. Um, yeah, and then, you know, aside from that, just just dive in and start trying to do something you know how to do really well in 7. And, and uh, there, I don't yeah, have I a list of three magic blogs or anything. I, I, have one I think a good place to start is to, to learn all of the, the powerful features of PHP, um, kind of in uh, the OO aspects of it. So, you know, classes and extensions and interfaces, uh, traits and, and kind of all of those things. And then, you know, dig into a little bit of some of the Symphony components that's built on, you know, the router, uh, look at some of the testing framework. So kind of, if you get up to speed, I think on a lot of the foundational technologies that it's built on, um, you're better able to read the code. You're better able to kind of walk around and, and check it out. There's There's also places out there that are doing like some some quick like uh, PHP for Drupal 8 boot camps. Uh, I think like PHP Architect is doing um, a pretty a pretty quick and easy code boot camp that kind of helps you get up to speed there. So there's 
there's a lot of things to learn, but those are all, these are all just really good things. Like whether or not you're doing Drupal 8 even specifically, just being able to go from more procedural languages to O languages to using more common frameworks. Like these are just all all good things for for people in their careers to know anyway. So it, there's a there's a lot of good motivation for both learning Drupal 8 and, and picking up those skills. So I'll add, like I was solely a functional programmer. That was my mindset. I, I did a lot of JavaScript early on, and then I went to PHP and Drupal. Which, Drupal 6 is all functional programming. Um, and my take when I was pretty much overwhelmed by Symfony is I stepped back and I focused, like Symfony integra is integrated into Drupal. I stepped back and focused solely on just understanding what Symfony was doing. And there actually is one tutorial I did, which was called Symblog, which was a building a blog in Symfony. And it just walked through all the different parts of setting up pages, routers, validation, emailing, even authentication in Symfony, which isn't applicable to Drupal 8. But it helped to do, to step back and approach Drupal 8's a complex machine and to approach Symfony object oriented from a smaller perspective helped a lot. One other key thing I can't emphasize enough is definitely you need a good IDE, especially because there's no documentation, so you need to be able to navigate D8, D8's code. I use PHP Storm that's becoming very popular, so if you run into an issue, you can inspect the objects, look around at the implementations, and going back to tests, that to me is the best documentation right now for Drupal 8. If you're running into an issue, you need to find a test for the component you're working with and read, read it and see what it's doing. Awesome. J so. Jake reminded me of, uh, even though I said there weren't magic blogs, there is a 12-part <laughs> blog series by um, Fabian Patencier, the Symphony lead, uh, mm -hmm. about dependency injection. Um, so if that's a, an entirely new concept, he walks through the hello world of a PHP app all the way through how you can leverage dependency injection. And that's all right, that's the, that's the one that elaborates each one that builds on the next. For all yeah, parts. It's, it's it's fantastic for just yep, getting that's that a good concept. One. All right, and recognizing that you guys are all, you guys all sit on the back end of the code. Do you have any front end resources that you would point out? Well, I think obviously learning learning Twig is is important, but um, you know, one of the good things that we're saying is that in a lot of cases, front end is not so much coupled to how Drupal does so many things anymore so um, mm -hmm. there's a lot less that there's a lot less of Drupal you have to know if you're going to be very pure uh, front end. Um, yeah I think that's by design right so that's uh, hopefully easier. Yeah I mean everything that's been done has really been about broadening the pool right uh, bringing in OPHP, bringing in Symfony that that allows uh, you know people from outside of a pure Drupal world to, to contribute and then you know, decoupling front end more allows people with less PHP and even more, less specifically, less Drupal skills kind of come into the mix as well. So it's done yeah. some really great things. Yeah, and I'll just point out that both for front end and back end developers, um, both build a module and um, Drupalize me have lots yep. of Drupal 8 uh, prep. Um, and a lot of it is free. So um, yeah. you can definitely go check that out for sure too. Those are both great services. Um, let's see. Uh, we, we still have more questions. I hope you guys can can keep going for ten more minutes. <laughs> um, so one of the things you talked about when we were talking about content types, you mentioned that you know you you, um, you basically you created some admin controls for each sort of area of content control, so that your content editors could you know manage their own content. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you train them um, and, and what it took to help your content editors get up to speed? Oh, that is a tricky one. Um, well, you know, I'm really fortunate on this site that we have a lot of experienced, very smart content editors, like the administrators, the people doing the heavy lifting on this site. No HTML. They're very comfortable learning it. I taught them YAML because sometimes it was easier to write, have them edit a YAML configuration file um, to administer the site. Going back to content types, um, I did a lot of, I did some additional cleanup to the node edit form to make it more manageable. Um, a very simple one, it's, this is all included in core, is you can break your node edit form up into tabs as well as use the sidebar and I kind of broke it down into 
tabs that made more sense for the contenders, um, an example would be when you get to a doctor bio, there's a publication tab, and in that tab, they can edit just the publications associated with the doctor. So I did do a lot of work on the node edit form to make it easier to use. Um, well, that, also another thing is that the the entire admin is built on things like views and whatnot, whereas in Drupal 7, a lot of the kind of core administration forms and, and things, th those were kind of hard-coded and you, you had to either work pretty hard to change them or just kind of build your own parallel um, administrative tools. So uh, Drupal 8 allows you to do a lot more customization on the administrative tools themselves to, to kind of have them more purpose-built for your audience. That's a pretty powerful thing too. You could, so you could yeah. lower the, the amount of training needed by, by building the tools that they understand better. Great. Yeah. <laughs> UX for your, for your admins is certainly important, right? Oh, yeah. Um, excellent. Um, can you talk a little bit about the resources required for the project? So, um, you know, what the spend was, how many staff it took um, on, the, on the MSK side, those sorts of things. Sure. Um, so some of this I'll, I'll have to um, count um, as I'm seeking to um, because there's, there's quite a bit of resources here. Um, so um, within MSK, um, our, our loan developer at the time it was, was Jake. Um, and so also on this team, um, we had um, somebody um, who sits on the UX side, um, also um, a web producer and a QA analyst. Um, and then outside, um, I'm sorry, one more piece here um, internally at MSK, which um, I think was really important to the success and the speed of the project um, was a program manager. Um, so we set up this project management office structure with um, executive sponsors, program manager, product leads, uh, work stream owners, um, and that really helped um, uh, the, um, set a lot of um, the, the finer goals, but also um, meet those goals as well in, in, the, in the time that we did. Um, and internally, we also had a um, our, our team of writers and editors um, at MSK. So well, you're looking at about six or seven people here internally. Um, step outside into phase two, um, we had uh, three front-end developers dedicated to the project, um, Jonathan contributing to core, and um, um, one back-end developer, that, is that right? Yeah, Toby? Uh, okay, so that's... Um, Another handful of people, plus um, you know Frank's leadership and uh, Mike Ledoux, also somebody else who um, worked at Phase Two, who was very insightful during the project, and the account team as well. Um, and then Digitas, right? So Digitas focused on um, UX strategy, design, the creative piece, um, um, but also did um, a lot of the front end development, um, or sorry, most of it, um, you know, the front end development that was done outside of Drupal, and then the Phase Two team kind of. You know, put that into Drupal. So um, you're probably looking at like another 15 people on the Digitas side. If you if you add in um, all the strategy piece, the UX, the, the development. Um, so you're probably looking, you're pushing like 25 people, 30 people for the project. Sorry to count that off the top of my head like that. I think it was good though to show like how kind of multidisciplinary it was. It's not just a you know a couple of devs in a room knocking things out. It's it's full team effort from from brand to implementation. Uh, and then there's the folks in IT on your side to help us get the environment set up and everything. So sure. yeah, yeah, over there. yeah. DevOps we haven't talked about. It. If there's any questions, I think we can answer them. Phew. <laughs> Big sites take uh, a village. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, let's see here. Well, I just want to see. Oh, do you guys have a, a, a checklist or any tools that you developed coming out of this um, that you might be able to share um, that people can help people walk through a six to eight migration? That's tricky. We did a custom migration. I didn't. We didn't address that. We had to because the migrate module is still under development. I don't recommend doing that. Um, the key thing with any migration, you got to make it repeatable and have servers set up to repeat it every night. And you go in and do it over and over and over again. And then you slowly wind down. You stop tweaking things until a week before your final migration. You freeze and make sure the site's moving over. Um, Right. But yeah, I also think it starts with something like a content inventory. I mean, you have to know what you have, um, and then you know you also need to know what you're building on the other side, on on the on the eight side, 
does your information architecture change? What's your content strategy? Like, how are how is it going to be different? Like, in a lot of cases, if you're going to be building the same exact thing in a different version of Drupal, that doesn't that doesn't make the best sense. You you kind of take this as an opportunity to to do the next evolution of how you of how you interact with your audience. So you kind of have to know where you're going and where you're uh, where you're coming from and where you're going, um, so that you can kind of plot that course between. Yeah, Frank, you reminded me. So we did do um, um, Larry Garfield at Pounder did a blog post developing Drupal sites Planner Parish, and he shared a spreadsheet that was. A I was just going to mention that. <laughs> yeah, we used it. We used it completely. I I would go with we had, I had 25 tabs breaking down everything from image styles, content types, fields, users taxonomies, everything, dumped out into a file. So, And we, I did that before we even approached um, Drupal shops to help us so that they could, everyone could get a sense of the scope of work. So I definitely recommend that. It was just done a very long time ago that I forgot that we did all that work. Yeah. I'm going to put that link in the chat for folks, too, because I think it's really interesting and helpful. So um, it's really detailed. So be prepared to sit down for a while. <laughs> we wrote tools to do the export, by the way. There are modules that are starting to do that, like in 7, that they'll dump out spreadsheets for you, so it'll just you don't have to manually type out every content type. Yeah. Great. Um, and then uh, just a couple of just quick, hopefully quick technical questions. Are, what, are you integrating the site with any other services? And how is that uh, working? We're doing a lot of internal integration. So we have Oracle. We call an Oracle database to pull our clinical trials over. LexiConf. I mean, there's a lot of like little snippets. Like they have an FTP. We pull medications off a LexiConf server. It is actually a zip file on an FTP server that we pull down, unzip. We use you know um, cores code, cores APIs to leverage that. Guzzle is what's included in core now. Um, with third parties. We have full Brightcove integration, so we pull we call Brightcove's API and get data about our videos so that we can kind of embed them on our site. Um, i trying to think of other, a couple of web services that people have set up internally to get us data. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing very heavy, like we're not posting blog posts to Twitter automatically through the website, and it just wasn't really a core requirement for this site. Okay. All right, and then the last one, it's the uh, last question we have in the whole queue, and you guys got them all, so well played. Uh, is, uh, someone noticed that my MSK is not using Drupal. And is that true, and why? That is true. Um, they're they're um, using uh, Sitefinity um, on a .NET platform. Um, I, it's for security purposes. I mean, they, I think they put that into place, uh, Jake, how many years ago? Um, my MSK came in like seven or eight years ago. Yeah. Um, and at the time, um, you know, I, um, they were just thinking um, a, a different platform that they felt was, uh, you know, they believe is stronger or, or I mean, um, more secure. Um, so they did not push towards um, Drupal at that time. And um, yeah, I don't think there's any plans there to shift that. Yeah, I, I'll also add, some countering is has is primarily a .NET shop. They have a lot of Windows developers, and the my MSKCC needs to integrate with many backend systems. And I think .NET is the right solution for that integration. All right. Well, we made it, and you guys were so amazing to share all of that, um, and uh, and then to answer all those questions. So thank you so much for you know both being at the forefront of this. Um, and you know, being the organization that was willing to learn all the hard lessons first, um, and then to share those back out to the community, that's obviously what Drupal is all about. So I'm just so, so grateful for that. Um, and uh, thanks again for your time today. And we're going to go ahead and wrap, uh, close things down. But for those of you who were attendees today, I just want to let you know that we are uh, we recorded today's session, so we'll be getting that out to you a little bit later. Um, and if you have further questions, feel free to let the association know, and we'll try to connect you with our speakers today so you can get those answered. So thanks again, everybody, and we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.